Computers are stupid. We give them fancy, undeserving names like smartphones, smart devices. But the truth is, they possess no intelligence whatsoever. At least not yet. Computers require explicit written instructions in order to do their jobs. However, you can guarantee that they'll do those jobs or die trying. I've been a computer programmer for most of my life. A computer programmer, software developer, software engineer, computer scientist. It's our job to tell the computer what to do. Computer programming has not only taught me how to make computers work for me, but it's also taught me how to make smarter decisions and how to be a better problem solver. When I was 12 years old, I went to a computer camp. And it was there I took my first introductory computer programming lesson. After the lesson, the instructor, Adam, challenged us to go beyond the lesson and to solve our very first computer programming challenge. The problem he presented us with was to draw a diamond on the screen. Well, simple enough, right? So that's exactly what I did. I opened up a word processor. I furiously typed in uh, a diamond based off of uh, some spaces and some asterisks. I copied and pasted that into a block of computer code. Then I told the computer program to just show what I had done. I went back to Adam. I said, look, I'm done. Now, Adam completely anticipated this cheeky solution because although I had done what he asked, the computer wasn't doing any work. I had done all the work. The computer just showed what I had done. So he ups the challenge. Now Adam says, OK, take what you've done, but now you have to ask the user for input, the user being the person running the program. He says, you have to ask the user for the length of the side of the diamond. For example, this diamond here has a side length of four. On each side, there are four asterisks. Now this completely changes things. I could still use that cheeky solution, but that would require, require me to write or draw an infinite number of diamonds from one into infinity, which is not very feasible at all and really wasn't what the challenge was about. So we've defined the problem. Draw a diamond given the length of one of the sides. But we have to first make sure we understand the problem. So what is a diamond? Well, it's a four-sided shape of four equal sides. So that's kind of like a square on a 45-degree angle. But it's also two triangles. If you cut that diamond in half around the center line and mirror it, you've got a triangle above and a triangle below. So now that we understand the problem a bit better, well, now we can just open up our geometry textbooks, right? We could find out the area of a square, the area of a triangle, or maybe we could leverage the Pythagorean theorem, c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared, sine, cosine, tangent, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> While that might work, and yes, triangle math is legit, uh, that is far too, much, uh, far too complex of a solution to our problem. And luckily for 12-year-old me, I hadn't even heard of Pythagoras yet, so I had to work with what I had. As problems come in and out of our lives, we have a tendency to sometimes overcomplicate them. Or sometimes the problem is so complex that we just ignore it completely and pretend it doesn't exist. Other times, we'll default to a familiar but ultimately ineffective solution. However, in this case, the problem with this problem is that we don't fully understand the problem. So a computer has no concept of space, let alone a diamond. And, well, a diamond to us is this shape that exists in blank space. So if I go in back to that first example of that diamond I drew and I highlight it, you know, a simple control A, you'll notice something. On the left-hand side of the diamond, that blank space is highlighted as well, while on the right-hand side above and below, it's not. That's because on the left-hand side of that diamond, there exists space, as in literally the space bar. Because to us, we just see a diamond, but a computer has no concept of space. For us, 
We use space or blank space to separate words and numbers and symbols to provide context, but the computer has no use for that. So to demonstrate this a bit further, I've replaced those spaces with the equal sign. The space character exists on our keyboard just like any other character of the alphabet, whether it's A, the number four, or the symbol for the asterisk. So by replacing those spaces with equal signs, we notice something. We're not drawing a diamond at all. We're drawing a five-sided polygon that I like to refer as a sideways house. <laughs> so although the original problem is to draw a diamond, the actual actionable problem is to draw a sideways house that appears as a diamond to us. Okay. So now that we really fully understand the problem, we can begin to break it down. And we'll do that by going line by line. So given an input of four, that is the length of each side of the diamond, line one is going to look like this, three spaces and one star. I've already noticed something. Three, places, three spaces plus one star. Three plus one is four. Four is the length of each side of the diamond. Interesting. Let's keep going. <laughs> Line two, two spaces, three stars. Line three, one space, five stars. I'm starting to notice a pattern. For each line, the number of spaces decreases by one, while the number of stars increases by two. So we could deduce that the next line, line four, is going to have no spaces and seven stars and we'll see that it does. So this is great, we're halfway there, but we already know that the diamond is just two triangles, one uh, reversed on top of the other across the center line. We've got the top half of the diamond, and we've got our center line. So now we just work our way back in reverse. We add one space and subtract two stars, and we do that until we get to a line that's three spaces, one stars, and equals to four the length of our diamond. We have just solved our very first computer programming algorithm. And just like your favorite cooking show, the code has already been written, so let's take it out of the oven and give it a taste. <laughs> so, so this is a command line interface, and although it looks old school, make no mistake, this is one of the most powerful tools on the modern computer. I'm going to run the program I wrote called diamond.js and give it an input of four. And we'll see that there's the diamond we drew. We can go down and show an input of two or up to 16. Or could I get a number from the audience? 32. 32 great number. And there is the 32, the, uh, diamond of length 32 in all its glory. And, and just for the sake of uh, going big or going home, Let's draw a diamond with side length of 500 and see what happens. I'll have to zoom out on this bad boy here. And there we, there we see it, the diamond in all its glory. Amazing. So it wasn't until much later in life that I realized the significance of a simple problem like the diamond one. In industry, with complex systems like Facebook, or the, Fal the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. In those complex systems, there exist millions of very small problems, not all that unlike our diamond one. Those small problems make up the much bigger problem of connecting billions of people together across the planet, or landing an autonomous rocket that's already been to space down onto an autonomous barge floating in the middle of the ocean. My company was recently, um, we recently finished a project for a customer in order to close a deal. The customer required some additional functionality out of our software uh, to make it useful to them. The, we completed the project, the customer was happy, but I wasn't. I figured we spent too much time catering to their needs, that our precious development schedule, the things we had to do, were pushed back and it wasn't worth it. That was until I took time to break down the problem. Well, how much did this actually cost us? So we spent about 40 development hours and eight sales and project management hours. So really, the project only cost us about $2,400 to build, which 
really isn't all that much money, especially when you consider the deal, the deal size. That deal was worth $480 per month recurring indefinitely. So if we can assume that that customer stays a customer for six months, we make our money back. That's a great investment. So we also gain a valuable relationship with the customer because we delivered on that promise. And that feature we made for them was made in a way so that our existing customer base and our future customer base could take advantage of it. Now, our development schedule did get pushed back, which is what worried me initially. But given, or now that I could see all the vari variables in front of me, the pros clearly outweighed that one con. Now, not all problems are as easily quantifiable as financial ones. I'm a runner. I'm training for my first full marathon this fall. The worst thing about being a runner is when you're not able to run. And unfortunately, just a few weeks ago, I was diagnosed with a stress fracture, which means no running for four to six months. You need six months to, uh, sorry, the marathon is in six months, and you need about four months to properly train for a marathon. So six months minus four to six months is equal to not enough time. <laughs> However, is, the, is it that I can't run the problem? The real problem is that I can't put any excess pressure, load, or tension on my left leg. So what if I could run without touching the ground? I'm happy to inform everyone that I've recently taken up the sport of aqua jogging. <laughs> and yes, it looks as ridiculous as it sounds. Aqua jogging is moving in the water in an upright position that mimics running on land and can result in similar physical metabolic benefit as running on land. And if it's on Wikipedia, it must be true. <laughs> so I'm combining this style of training with a regular cross-training gym routine and a stationary bicycle, and I think it's going to pan out. If you'd like to see how I, uh, how I fare, feel free to look me up online for race results for the Queen City Marathon 2019, and I hope you don't find a did not finish next to my name. The hardest problem that I've ever been up against is something called anxiety and depression. And I regret to inform you that I have not solved this one yet. In fact, I might never solve it. But if I can take this really complex and abstract problem and break it down into manageable pieces, well, maybe I can make that overall problem suck a little bit less. Did I get an adequate amount of sleep last night? Did I get my daily aqua jog in? Is it that I'm not hungry, or is it that I have anxiety surrounding the meal preparation process? These are just some of the questions and tools that I use to check in with my condition. So, if you want to make smarter decisions and be a better problem solver, approach them like a computer programmer would. Define your problem. Make sure you fully understand the problem. Break the problem down into small and manageable pieces. Go as deep as you can until you can get to easy yes or no questions. Work your way up from the bottom until the problem is solved. But most importantly, recognize that some problems are completely out of your control and they'll be impossible to solve. And that's okay. If you can make a really big problem a little bit easier, that's a win in my books. <laughs>